Today, I'm going to take you through a few of my most important add-ons and integrations so you can see how I'm using Home Assistant in my setup. So let's get started. As always, I like to start my videos with the dashboard display so you can see a lot of the things that I run within my Home Assistant instance. Some of these are powered by the add-ons and integrations that I'm going to talk about. So we're going to go over to the add-ons section under Supervisor, and I'm just going to show you some of my add-ons that I have going on here. So this is my add-on list, and it's in no particular order other than the alphabetical order that it comes up on the add-ons page. And so we'll start with AdGuard. I use AdGuard as my primary DNS server for all of my devices on my network. In fact, I'm running two instances of AdGuard. One is running on this production server, and the other is running on my backup server or my backup Raspberry Pi 4. And that's when I do upgrades or restart this host, my family and friends that are on my network don't lose DNS resolution. AdGuard is a very robust and very nice um, a DNS server that allows you to do a number of things. Uh, for one thing, you can set up um, client filters. You can set up uh, rewrites. So for example, if you're trying to access something inside your local network and you want to give it a DNS name, let's say bw. Um, you know, domain name.com inside your network, you're going to want it to resolve to an internal IP address and externally, you're going to want it to resolve to your public. So you're able to do DNS rewrites. Uh, you have a very nice query log. So if you're curious what things are being queried on your network, um, you can use different upstream DNS servers. Uh, there's a lot of built in filtering. So you have block lists. So you have your built in AdGuard DNS filter. Addaway is another, another one. You can build your own custom block lists. And of course, like I talked about the, the, uh, log here, you can see everything that's going on. And then of course, how you set up your devices. They have a, a little bit of a help for each type of device that you might have in your network on how to use and set these things up. So that's one of my very favorite uh, add-ons. Next up is Bitwarden. Bitwarden is an open source password manager. With Bitwarden, you can store sensitive information such as website credentials in, a, in an encrypted vault. So it has a, a number of client applications. So I run a, you can see up here that I run a, a Chrome add-on and I also run this on my phone. I run it on various things and it allows you to keep a list of passwords. I have a video on this one as well. And it, it allows you to, uh, for me, store a bunch of different passwords uh, for every site. So I have a single password for every site that I log into. None of my passwords are the same. I don't have to remember those. Those are all stored here. Um, so I, I always advocate using a password manager and then you can read the full documentation there. Next up, Duck DNS, and I have a video on that, of course, as well. Duck DNS allows me to remotely access my DN or my home assistant instance, and it keeps up with my public IP address. So when I go to domain.duckdns.com, it redirects me back over to my home assistant server. As long as I have my port forwarding set up correctly within my router, then I can get to my instance from anywhere. And if my public IP address changes, then it updates my public IP address and updates the DNS resolution so that I can always get to my home assistant instance remotely. File editor, I use this occasionally. I use it more on my development Raspberry Pi 4 than I do on this because I use Visual Studio Code as a uh, standalone application. But what the file editor does is it allows you to go into your files on your device and it allows you to uh, edit those right here within the browser window. So if I want to edit my sensors, I can just go into file editor and edit my sensors and any of the files that I have here. So it makes it a very handy and it's lightweight. So it's quick, easy to, to uh, spin up and doesn't take a lot of resources to run. It's a very handy thing to have around if you need to do simple file edits. So that's important for me as well. The next few of these things, or the next two of these, go hand in hand. Grafana is an, it says here, open platform for beautiful analytics and monitoring. And I use Grafana like this. Uh, you can see where I store all of my data and, and stuff that I want to keep track of over time. Weather's a big one. So with Grafana, I use 
all of my, or I store all my weather data points in Grafana. Now this Grafana actually pulls from another add-on, which is the Influx DB add-on. Grafana can pull from multiple types of data sources. If you're running a MariaDB or MySQL or something else, you can also use that. But I happen to use the Influx because Influx DB is a time-based uh, storage uh, system, if you will. And so what it does is it stores these data points over time, and then Grafana pulls those data points from the database and just displays them directly in these visualizations that you can create. And you can create all kinds of things with these with these visualizations. Uh, well, another one I have here is a quick, quick glance page. It has a bunch of different graphs and gauges. Some of these are older, not updated as much as they used to be. I have a number of Grafana videos. So if you want to look at those videos, make sure you check those out on my channel. And make sure, by the way, that you subscribe to my channel if you're not a subscriber and hit that bell icon so you're alerted whenever I make new videos about stuff like this. Keeps you up to date on the things that I'm doing here. All right, so we've talked about Grafana and we've talked a little about InfluxDB. Now InfluxDB also has the capacitor web UI that allows you to, uh, I'm sorry, it's chronograph. It allows you to explore your database directly without having anything else. So if I go into uh, explore here, I can now search for specific things within my database. Let's see, uh, say I'm looking for temperature data points. So I'll select data points here. And this is not a video about using Influx or this explorer, but it is just an idea what you can do with this built-in add-on. And so if I wanna find a value these are all the devices now that have Fahrenheit. So I have a number of devices in my network or in my home assistant environment or ecosystem that provide Fahrenheit data. So that's another one. So now that I'm using uh, Duck DNS, I don't necessarily need the Let's Encrypt, but that is a very handy one to have too. If you want to manage your SSL certificates with Let's Encrypt, you can build out all of your, and I'm not running it right now, so I can't really show it, but if you want to manage SSL certificates using um, a challenge response mechanism. Let's Encrypt is a good way to do that. So that's an important one too. Mosquito Broker, if you have anything that you want to do MQTT wise, and I'm pulling some data from one of my weather sensors using MQTT, and there are a lot of things out there that will send data to you over MQTT, this is an add-on that's important for that. So this is a broker that you can use to pull in MQTT data. And then when once it's in here, you can build sensors and templates to pull that data into Home Assistant and use that for all kinds of stuff, automation, displaying, storing it in databases and that kind of thing. Another big one that I use is Node-RED. Node-RED is my go-to choice for automations. And the reason why that's the case is I used to have automations um, in the early days of Home Assistant were much harder to build than they are today. Now with the graphical interface, They've made a lot of strides to make automation so much easier within Home Assistant natively, but I still enjoy Node-RED. And I'll show you a couple things that I do with Node-RED just to show you an example of what you can do with it. And of course, Node-RED, when it's tied and added to Home Assistant, talks directly back to your Home Assistant instance. Um, so you can do all these things, pull all this information directly from your Home Assistant setup. So one of the things I like to do is check my fridge door, for example. Let me hide this little window. Now remember, I have a video on all of these things that I'm talking about today, or at least most of them. So make sure you check out my channel and check for these videos. One of the examples I can do with, with uh, Node-RED that's harder in maybe automations or was in the day was setting up a timer to check to see if a door was left open. In my case, the fridge door. Anytime the fridge door is open, a two minute timer starts. Anytime it's closed, the timer gets stopped through this little switch node here. So if the timer expires, it comes down here and checks my fridge door status. If the door is still open, or in this case, the status is on, which means it's open, it will send me a notification to my pushover uh, application, which then sends it to my watch and my phone and all those places where I have pushover clients running. It also announces it over my smart speakers within my house, so I know that the door is open. This is especially important because I may not be the only one that's working with that fridge door. Somebody in the family may have it open, so it just alerts anyone that's around to go ahead and close the door. We don't have one of those smart refrigerators that can do that for us. So this is a workaround. And what I'm using for that for is just a little uh, normal magnetic door sensor, Z-Wave. 
you can watch the video on that as well because I have a video on a lot of stuff, right? So check that out. So Node Red is a super important one for me. I do a lot of stuff with Node Red. I use Portainer to manage my Docker environment. Um, that's that's okay for what I'm doing here, and it works well. I've had a few occasions where I had to go in and actually do something on the containers. I don't use that very much because there's not a lot of need to do that right now. This one, Samba Backup or Samba Backup, is extremely important. I create snapshots, one snapshot per day, uh, at it says 1:36 random time, 1:36 a.m. I start a Samba backup. And what it does is it pulls a full snapshot and it moves it via Samba over to my network attached storage, my NAS device. And I'm, uh, if you want to learn more about that, of course, look at the video for that. I know this sounds like a commercial for videos, but uh, it's interesting when I look back on these add-ons, how many things I've created videos for. So anyway, there's a, there's a video for this, but it creates this every day. I highly, 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 highly couldn't any higher recommend making backups and getting them off your device. A backup is no good if you can't get into your device. And then we as tinkerers mess with this stuff all the time. We're going to break a configuration and we're going to prevent our system from booting up. And then we don't have access to our snapshot. So get something through Google drive or this kind of Samba backup or, um, what's the other big, backup thing. Uh, there's another one. There's three of them that I know for sure. And FTP, there's an FTP version. Get this stuff off your off your device onto a, another, another something. You can even with Samba, I guess, put it onto a, another Windows computer or something within your network, or even a Linux server. You can store it on a directory there. So point is make a backup. That's why I think this one is very important to have because you need to be backing up your system every day regularly and then store it offsite somewhere or off your device anyway. All right, uh, a few more of these here. Um, Samba Share, I use this because I, again, I talk about using Visual Studio Code standalone. And with Visual Studio Code standalone, I can connect to my, to my uh, configuration folder on my Home Assistant device using uh, the Samba Share. So I just share it. Terminal and SSH, uh, I use that sometimes. If I need to run a command directly on the terminal, that allows me to do that. That's an important one. Unify controller. Um, I run a Unify network here. So my cloud controller or my controller is all on this box. That is an add-on that's convenient for me here. Would it be better to maybe run it on a different system in case this goes down? Maybe, but it's convenient to have it here. As long as you're making snapshots, at least you can get it back up and running if something fails. I use WireGuard for uh, VPN access. And then one of the final add-ons I have installed currently is my Z-Wave JS to MQTT. This is all of my Z-Wave devices within my network. So this is how I control it. Now there's, there's a whole discussion on Z-Wave. I have a number of videos on Z-Wave, Z-Wave JS, Open Z-Wave, uh, migration from point A to point B because uh, we're, we're moving from Open Z-Wave Beta to now Z-Wave JS in the Home Assistant ecosystem as the preferred way to run Z-Wave. The Z-Wave add-on by itself, there's Z-Wave add-on, uh, JS add-on, there's Z-Wave JS to MQTT, which is what I have here. Those two add-ons do the same thing for the most part. The difference is this MQTT one, even if you're not using MQTT, allows you to have a visual UI for you to do things, especially if you want to do things like configure your sensors or your Z-Wave devices. So if I wanted to go to configuration and then update how often the thing wakes up or goes to sleep or how often uh, a temperature is sent based on a threshold, all this stuff can be done via the configuration on the UI. Now Home Assistant is iterating on this over, uh, quite rapidly, quite rapidly. So that means that you can now set configuration uh, variables for devices through Home Assistant's call service calls, but you still have a UI here to use that makes it a little bit easier. You have to really understand the thing that you're working with and you have to understand um, what configuration parameters to set. If you're doing it through the service calls, here you have a UI. In addition, uh, at least at this, as of this recording, you can't do firmware upgrades necessarily, I don't believe. So you can do a firmware upgrade uh, for 
devices using Z-Wave JS to MQTT, not necessarily the native Z-Wave JS add-on. Again, there's no real difference between these two with the exception of the updates. This is this will be updated as its own add-on. So if this add-on gets updated later than the Z-Wave JS add-on, then there might be a feature parity for a little bit, but it, it's pretty close. I personally will be running this uh, for the, the meantime. And then one of the other reasons is I I run uh, Quickset 910 locks and the Quickset 910 locks force are are forcing me to have to do a pole interval to get the status of the bolt, so the door lock itself. Until that gets resolved in Z-Wave JS, I'm gonna to have to do the polling, and I don't know of any way to do polling within Z-Wave on Home Assistant, the, the Z-Wave JS add-on. All right, so I beat that to death, but, to death, but I think that's a very important add-on because this is what I run all of my Z-Wave network, and my, my Home Assistant is primarily Z-Wave, and you can tell that by looking at my network and see, whoops, you can see here all of these things, the locks, all these lights, uh, a lot of the motion sensors, the temperature sensors for internal stuff and all of that is Z-Wave based. And so it's important my Z-Wave network functions. All right, so we've talked a lot about the add-ons. What I do wanna talk about briefly here is just a couple of the integrations that I use. Uh, one of the most important ones here is the media player from this thing. This allows me to voice out things that I want to talk about, such as the alerts for the, the fridge alarm. Those things I can talk to from here. Um, and, and there's, um, let me see, there's that one. Then we have the EcoWit weather station. The EcoWit weather station is what I pull in my EcoWit data from my EcoWit GW1000 Wi-Fi gateway, which then listens for the transmissions from my backyard weather station and puts them in here. ESP Home is another one. That's where I start using my ESP devices um, to listen for, for example, I have one in my refrigerator that listens to the temperature from a, a, blow, a BLE, a low energy Bluetooth device that sits in there. Uh, my Flume is my um, water, water meter, water pressure sensor that tells me if there's any issues with that. Uh, printer is pretty nice because with the printer, I can tell ink levels and we can look at that here. This is what I get from my printer. I can see what link ink, ink levels are. So let's say these two are getting their, their less than half. Now, if they get down to say 15, 10%, I can fire it off an automation that tells me I need to replace these or at least order these, these cartridges so they can be ready to go. That's a nice thing to have. Um, what else do we have here? So HACS is very important. That's, that's a whole video by itself, but I talk about HACS in my Back to the Basics series, so watch that. It's essentially a repository for all kinds of add-ons that you can put into Home Assistant that aren't specifically for, built by the core developers, but they're built by the community. So it's called the Home Assistant Community Store, and that's what it's for. Um, let me find some others that might be worthwhile. Uh, of course, the weather service I use for forecasts and things on there and, and some alerting. This I use for my Nest thermostats. That, that is a whole series of videos all by itself. If you have Nest devices and you want to integrate them in Home Assistant, um, that's probably one of the hardest ones we've had to do, but that's available for you as well. Own tracks for location tracking, Plex Media Server, the Ratio, Ratio uh, sprinkler system, my Roku's, my Shelly's that I use for flood alerts and other things. I do a little speed test stuff here. My Synology that I talk to my Synology with. And then of course my Unify and then my Z-Wave. Now this is what I talked about. This, this Z-Wave JS integration talks to the add-on. The add-on and the integration translate, talk back and forth and do all the work to get my devices, my Z-Wave devices to show up in Home Assistant. So those are just some of the add-ons and integrations that I use in my home assistant to make everything run around here. I hope you found that useful. Again, I make a lot of videos based on those add-ons, so you can check those out. Uh, look at my video list and my playlist for that. If you have any questions about any of those that uh, you're wondering about, let me know down in the comments below. Again, a reminder to subscribe and hit that bell icon so you're notified when I do make videos. And I do try to live stream every couple of weeks, so you'll get an announcement about that as well. 
Uh, let me know if you have any questions on my Discord server as well. And we will see you on the next video.